Thank you. So thank you, Sudeep, for this wonderful opportunity and uh, for having this lovely course every year. Uh, so I'll be speaking on intraoperative meiosis and iris prolapse, basically IFIS. Uh, rapid or not, it's always IFIS. I'm Subhan Bhattacharji, and I'm the inventor of the BHEX, and I have a financial interest in management devices. I acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Deepak Magur for one of my videos over here. So intraoperative myosis and iris prolapse, the spectrum ranges from mild to severe, where mild is only iris billowing, whereas uh, with good pupillary dilation, whereas severe is iris billowing, and a poor pupillary dilatation and iris prolapse. Now, I was fortunate that ASCRS made this uh, wonderful video of mine in 2013 to 30,000 ophthalmologists worldwide, based on my IC presented at the ASCRS in San Francisco. So let's take a look at this uh, video. So, so this is a case of, uh, I mean, the different cases. So the first one is where you see just billowing of the iris or uh, undulation of the pupillary margin. And that is, uh, we have a fairly uh, reasonable pupillary dilatation, so that is nothing to worry at this stage. Uh, this is a case which is a classic IFIS. As the anterior chamber is inflated, the pupil dilates, and as soon and with no reason whatsoever, the pupil again comes down. And I'm, I'm having difficulty removing that chopper, and we have an iris prolapse already. Now again, when I inject viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, the pupil dilates. That's a typically elastic pupil of an IFIS. So there again. Again, I'm striking. Nothing wrong with my flow parameters. This is perfectly all right. But this is a very old video. Before even we recognize IFS, actually, I pulled it out from my archives. So now this is a very good technique to reposit the iris. You just decompress the anterior chamber. That's very important because you keep injecting and the iris will prolapse. And here we have iris prolapsing from both the side ports. Not a very happy situation, but still the pupil is reasonably good where we can, we can dilate, but when we inject viscoelastic, the pupil dilates, so we can happily finish up the case, and that's the undulation of the iris at the end of the surgery. Now, this is a case where, which was a nightmare. Now, I saw IFIS right in the beginning, recognize it, and put iris hooks, but then before I could finish my capsular excess, the iris was tattered totally. So now I'm struggling with that FACO probe. I might cause an iridodialysis because the iris is going to get engaged over here. The good thing is to use that side port instrument to kind of uh, release the iris and protect it as the FACO probe advances or any instrument advances into the anterior chamber. Now then, and now it's my turn to struggle with that largest chopper that I am having. It's a hardish cataract, so I want to use a large chopper. So inject viscoelastic, create space, and you can see that patulous iris bowing like a sail. And now uh, I have an iris knuckle in the uh, incision. Uh, I really can't do much about it. But then fortunately, we have a good dilatation. That's what the devices provide, is they provide a safe dilatation to complete the surgery. And now uh, it's turn for the IOL. And again, I'm worried that I might engage the iris, the, the frayed iris. So again, I protect it. And now once it's past the iris, I can easily inject that IOL into the bag. And now I deposit the iris and from all the ports. And a good idea is to use uh, change your angle of attack and kind of use a side port to reposit the iris from the main. And so you can see it's looking like a fishing net. And now that I've done that, I choose to hydrate the incisions. And unfortunately, as I'm hydrating, the iris again prolapses. As soon as the anterior chamber pressure increases, the iris will prolapse. Well, I go ahead and uh, kind of hydrate that uh, incision further. And then, because once it's sealed, the iris will not prolapse. Once I've got a seal, now I can again pull that iris back and we are in a happy situation. So this looks pretty good now. Let's look at uh, intraoperative masses and how we, the BHEX can help. So this is a hard cataract and halfway through the surgery, or actually when I've just about finished half of the cataract, uh, a heminucleus is left, which is pretty hard. And with that kind of a people, I'm not really encouraged to go ahead. So now, uh, this is because of uh, probably some amount of nucleus. So now we inject viscoelastic over that capsular rim to create space for the BHEX and then take that first flange and tuck it under the iris. Now you note how easy it is to identify that you have not engaged the capsular excess margin there. As you push it, advance it towards the periphery, you have instant confirmation that you have not engaged the capsular excess margin again as you engage, it's under direct visualization and you have so much control over that flange that even if you engage the capsular excess margin, you can retract. You cannot do that with other devices. So once you have that 5.5 millimeter pupil, you are in the safe zone, you are back to your comfort zone and you can finish off that FACO emulsification with ease, however hard that cataract is. It's just that 5.5 pupil that you require to complete the surgery. 
Now let's see what's the difference between the mulligan ring and the BHEX. The gaps in the scrolls are not visible from the top view in a mulligan ring. And if you do engage the microcapsular excess margin, it's a disaster because it's a continuous process. Now in the BHEX, the gaps and the notches are clearly visible from a top view. And uh, even if it engages, it generally engages the pupil margin with certainty. If it engages the capsular excess, you can still kind of uh, disengage it. Now, this is a video from Dr. Deepak Magur, a wonderful video. So, uh, well, even at this stage, he's not contemplating using devices, starts the FECO, but then it's a pretty hard cataract. Well, now it's time to choose a device. He chooses the BHEX. So a little bit of viscoelastic over the capsule. Let's look at the ease with which the flanges are tucked under the capsular excess margin without engaging the capsular excess. So there you have, once you are comfortable with that pupillary dilatation, you can go ahead and finish the surgery. So can we, uh, can the preoperative pupil uh, dilatation be used to predict IFAS? So this is a paper in 2011, JCRS by Alessandra Casuccio and co-workers. The conclusion was for a pupil seven millimeters or smaller, the risk of IFAS existed regardless of alpha blocker antagonist or alpha blocker treatment. So is IFAS a problem in India? Well, turns out that it is, and it is a bigger problem Prevalence of tamsulosin intake and IFAS incidence is higher in India. And guess what? Uh, tamsulosin, alfalosin use, and hypertension are very important risk factors. I mean, about 60 to 70% of our patients are hypertensive. So that's the list of drugs which can cause IFAS and systemic conditions like hypertension, chronic heart failure, and diabetes. So no amount of history taking can prevent surprises. And intraoperative is unpredictable. So let's be very clear about that. Now, this is a case. Uh, well, you can use your judgment and let me know, was it too early to use a pupil expander device? A pupil with just 5.5, nuclear cataract grade four, planning a toric IOL, hypertensive patient, a short eye, and a shallow anterior chamber. Let's look at this. So we've done our markings. A pupil is, I mean, not uh, very small. If it were not for a shallow AC, and the kind of signs I saw here when I was injecting viscoelastic eye kind of coming out, I noticed a flicker of iris prolapse. So I said, no, I'm going to do a BX. Now this looks very harmless. In fact, it looks as if it's useless. Now look at that iris prolapsing from the side port. The side port is not large. It's only because the iris prolapse is looking big. And now you see the, in, the iris is prolapsed from the main incision. So these are the eyes which are prone. And if you have a hint of iris prolapse in the beginning, it's better to take that call early. I do manage to, that, yeah, there again, a device always provides you a good pupillary dilatation for safe FICO emulsification. It may not prevent iris prolapse, but most of them don't, I'll be coming to that. So devices have got nothing to do with prolapsing it. Now this is where the BX is a huge advantage. You can take it in a prolapsing iris, you can take it out through a side put. I have to be careful not to touch the endothelium, but then I can disengage those flanges and take it out through the side port. No device, no pupil expander can do that. And that's a huge blessing when you have a situation like this. So post facto, how many would have, uh, of you would have used the iris hooks or pupil expander? So it is important to take that call early, but before you are in a mess. So BX is probably the only device which can be removed through a one millimeter side port. And that is a huge advantage in when you have iris prolapsing through all the side ports and the main incision. So a choice of my choice of people expanded in trophomyosis, either iris hooks or a BX. Iris hooks are also pretty good if you're if you're happy with putting four incisions, as long as you don't over retract. But you must remember that neither iris hooks nor be the BHEX will, or any device for that matter, will prevent iris prolapse. I'll come to that. Now, which is the best device? If, I, if you ask me, iris hooks, people expand among all the people expand. So let's take a look at it this objectively. Now, you have two components over here, meiosis and iris prolapse. For the meiosis component, do they use iris hooks or people expand? What they do is they provide a constant pupil size, which allows good visibility for safe fake emulsification. That's fine with both the set of devices. For iris prolapse, actually no device helps. Iris prolapse depends on the severity of IFS and the pathological damage to iris stroma and muscles. So there is no credit to the pupil device when you don't have iris prolapse. It's just lower grade IFS. Remember that. Just because you got away in, in IFS in one case with one device, it will not happen in the other. So a favorable pupil expansion device in IFIS is, which requires small incisions, has a low vertical profile, can exit through the side port, and I think iris hooks and BX qualify very well for that. So the lessons that we've learned in these cases of IFIS is there is a host of systemic conditions that could cause IFIS and hypertension 
is unfortunately an important risk factor. And patients with pre-op pupils of even seven millimeters are at risk, irrespective of alpha blocker treatment. It is also important to remind, remember that tamsulosin may be used for urinary retention in women, and they may absolutely be unaware of that. As I said, iris hooks and pupil expanders, they do not eliminate iris prolapse. They may reduce the intensity of iris fluttering or prolapse, but they do maintain a dilated pupil, providing visibility and safety, and that is where their role is. So every eye is an IFIS candidate. We need to reduce our threshold for using pupil devices and keep yourself well stocked in your theater. If you're interested in reading this more about BX Pupil Expand, the tips and tricks is a wonderful uh, PDF which you can download from the website. The page is uh, medinventdevices.com. The page is BX Pupil Expander, subpage of Thalmic Surgeon. You have PDF, the video links over there running along the text. And when you click on it, you get to the exact scene. And if you want to read, read something on uh, fake emulsification of small people, I have penned an article in uh, eofta.com. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Thank you once again for your kind attention and thank you, Sudeep, for this opportunity again. Thank you.